Welcome to Get the Facts, the program that provides you with information on government's policies and initiatives. I'm your host, Enthros Campbell. Now, today we'll be talking with consultant psychiatrist Dr. Jeffrey Walcott on how to cope with the loss of a loved one, especially at this time of the year. Dr. Walcott, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. All right, so many persons this year will be facing the festive season without a loved one. Many yes. persons, maybe through accidents or COVID-19 or other causes, but people are not able to, 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 to cope, you know? Tell us, first, explain the impact of the, of the death of a loved one. Well, you see, most persons experience loss differently, yes. but there are commonalities. But I think one of the most important things for us to recognize is that dealing with grief is a normal human experience. It's something that we have to go through, it's inevitable, and it's not a pathology. In saying that, however, we recognize that it is painful and can be immensely painful for, for persons who are experiencing, depending on how close they are to the person that they have lost. And so there's been a sort of framework that has been developed to identify the emotional states that persons go through. Um, Dr. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross had developed a, a, a pattern of grief that we see. And initially what you see early in the loss is the business of denial. Persons end up in mm -hmm. shock because you can't process it at the immediate um, impact of the event. And then persons go through feelings of anger, you go through stages of bargaining, and then eventually you then start to have the feelings of depression and finally acceptance. Mm -hmm. And those steps are not clear or linear. In other words, people can go through various stages mm -hmm. at various times, and there's no time limit. So each person is different. But what you require during those stages remains somewhat similar. People need information, they need connection, they need su support, emotional support, and at the end, they need guidance and some amount of uh, direction as to how to get their lives to move on while yes. incorporating the loss that they've gone through. Yes. What kind of information you're talking about when you here? talk about persons having to deal with the shock, it's important for you to engage with them and to actually help them to process the events of what's been happening. Um, you think of a, a sudden loss, for example, COVID-19, immediately persons start to question what's happened in the hospital, what happened with the person, what, what's going on. And it's important for you, to, even though the questions may seem um, difficult or, or intrusive, it's important to take the time and follow through and answer the questions of the persons that are grieving mm -hmm. because it allows them to move beyond the stage of shock and, and denial that they're going through. Mm -hmm. And we have to spend time talking to people. I think that's the most critical yeah, thing. That's important, yes. So would the impact be different depending on the age of the person? It does, and depending on the experience. Because persons who have dealt with loss before are tend to be more resilient. Resiliency is a is a is a is a trait, not a character trait, but it's a, it's a learned process that we develop over time. The more difficulties we go through, the more adversities, the stronger we are at dealing with future events. And so persons will vary b based on experience, based on age, uh, based, based on stage of development and psychological strengths. So it it's tends to be different with each person, but some of the commonalities are they all need support. They all need a shoulder or a listening ear, and we all need um, a supportive community around us when you go through mm -hmm. these. So it's not true that children would deal with it better than probably an older person, not even not a middle-aged person, but an old, a much older person? Not necessarily. I mean, the issue with children is that they, they, their processing of it might be different because they may mm -hmm. not understand or, or be able to conceptualize the issues as they are for an adult, mm -hmm. but it still has lasting effects. And in some cases, the effects that mm -hmm. you see in children could be far worse because it can then manifest itself in the later years. And so it's important for us while we recognize it to not exclude or to uh, dismiss mm -hmm. the experience that anyone is going through when it comes to dealing with pain and suffering. Right. Talk to us about some of what we should look out for, the signs that we would see and the kind of behavior in persons who are going through this kind of grief. I think one of the important hallmarks or triggers for the, 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 the intervention process is withdrawal. Persons who are going through any form of psychological pain or suffering will have a normal tendency to withdraw and that's the wrong and counterproductive thing to do mm -hmm. because at this stage is when you actually need to have the support of persons around you, not necessarily to discuss what's happened, but just to be there, just to be in a safe space with persons that are supportive, that are sharing in the grief. And that's why when you look at how almost every culture 
deals with the process of loss. The, the actual rituals are quite similar. It has to do with coming together of communities, coming together of families, because we know that those things are impactful in allowing persons to process the loss and the trauma in a healthy way. And so it's important to recognize and counter when persons are trying to isolate or withdraw and, and offer them help. Right, so we don't necessarily need to try to get them out. Not necessarily, just to be there and just to check up on them. Even if they sometimes don't want you to call or don't want to say, still do it. Still Give them the option or the opportunity mm -hmm. to engage with persons once they're going through this pain and not to go through it alone. Okay, so um, what other signs, can we look with? So there's withdrawal, are there, are there any kind of sign, other signs? So, and I think what the delineation is to identify when clinical or or um, significant uh, impairment has occurred where mm -hmm. we'll need professional help. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where you alluded to. What the well, issue is, mm -hmm. once you you have changes in your sleep patterns, your appetite, physiological changes. In other words, you're being impaired now, first physically and then psychologically, not able to perform at work, not able to, to do your normal daily routine. And then that may be a need for some level of professional intervention. Yeah. But it's important to understand because most people view psychiatric care or psychological care as an intrusion or as, a, as, a, as somewhat of a a forced entity but it's really not we're here to yes, help and yes, to yes, provide yes. support as much as you need okay we're going to be coming back to talk more about that the intervention so we're going to take a break now this is an important conversation and we're talking about mental health dealing with grief and what we need to do if that stays with us for too long we we'll come back in a short while stay with us Welcome back to Get the Facts. Our discussion continues on how to cope with the loss of a loved one, especially at this time, with our consultant psychiatrist, Dr. Jeffrey Walcott. All right, so we're talking about interventions. At what point should we, two persons, actually go get help, professional help? Well, th there's a short answer to that. And the short answer is if they feel they need or if the family has a concern, you should seek help. Because all if, if it's not needed, we will just guide you along that process. But if it is needed, it's better to err on the side of mm -hmm. caution. Um, but there are specific things. Um, once you have any in, impairment in your physiological function, by that I mean any changes in sleep, appetite, that's impacting your day-to-day -day functioning, as well as your inability to now do what you would normally be responsible for doing. So any form of impairment would re necessitate getting some level of professional help, difficulty in processing grief, intense distress. If you feel that you cannot cope, it may be prudent to seek professional help. And remember, as I said, we are here to provide help and support, not necessarily to provide medication and forced treatment, okay. which tends to be the stigma for psychiatry and yes, mental health yes, services. Right. So we are here to help, and it doesn't matter. As long as you're having difficulty and you think you need it, we will help you. So, But, but about how long, though, should person be grieving for? There is absolutely no way of telling yes, that. But yes. in essence, the process should not be impacting your functionality 
for greater than a, probably a two or three week period. And if it continues to impact your functionality beyond that point, you will need assistance to maneuver the channels of grieving that you're going mm -hmm. through and to actually help you. And in some instances, because when you talk about what is to be done, our main focus in the beginning is just to establish a, a, a place of safety for you to be able to process. And that can be psychological, emotional, or even guiding you towards uh, physical safety, because in some instances, the grief or the loss may be, may be associated with danger. So it's establishing safety is one of the primary areas that we focus on in the therapeutic relationship first. And then we guide the client through the different stages of grief that they have to go through. Mm -hmm. and, and finally, to a stage of acceptance and understanding that Having gone through this, you're never going to be the same, but you're going to be able to carry on. Right. What are some of the things we can do? Say my mother died, God, well, my mother has died. My mother died and um, i just not getting over it. And people recommend that you try to write her a note or you try to go to the grave to talk to her. What are some of the things? You so there, are, there are some techniques that we utilize and I think yes. it, it tends to be very specific for the different persons because it depends on the relationship that you had and what are the things that you are being having hung up about. Is it unresolved issues that we help you to explore? Is it is it feelings of anger that you feel guilty about so therefore you're not processing the anger itself? So there are several reasons why you get stuck in the grief cycle and part of the, the, the process of the therapeutic um, intervention is about getting you first of all to a level of insight and understanding which means that you have to identify the exact place that you are, the emotion that you're struggling with, and then we guide you through the processing of that emotion. And it could be any one of them. It could be the emotion of the shock, because we still have persons now who are in shock and denial about this, the loss of, of normality in our lives and not yes. accepting it. Yes. Or it could be the anger that you're stuck in. And anger tends to be a very tricky emotion because people get the feeling that they don't have the right to be angry because they feel guilty about being angry, especially being angry with the person because they are no longer here. But this is a normal emotion and it helps for you to process it and to accept it and to move beyond it. Right. So where do we go to get help? So one of the interesting things about our country as it stands now, most if not all the public health facilities have mental services attached to them in the nearest community clinic that you can have. And there's a, a plethora of both private and public entities that provide psychiatric and psychological services. And the Ministry of Health actually has several helplines that they have created to be able to direct persons to access um, psychotherapeutic or supportive psychotherapeutic services and mental health services all across the island. So all you need to do is to reach out to one of your health facilities or even your private practitioner and they can guide you to accessing mental health care, both in the public and private sector. And, and this is, you can actually go directly to the accident and emergency you can section. go to the casualty department the or the health center, which is yes. usually closest to you. And the health center, if they, if they don't have a clinic on that day, they can give you the list of where you can access it or the numbers that you can call in terms of persons struggling with psychological pain and suffering. Right. Right. What is the difference between a psychiatrist and a psychologist? All right, so psychiatry is a medical discipline that is focused on the behavior, thoughts, and emotions. Psychology is social sciences and focuses more on behavioral mm -hmm. transformation. And so it is quite similar in terms of the long-term impact that we have on the patient. But we deal with, psychiatrists deal with the pathology element in terms mm -hmm. of focusing on the, the clinical aspect, which short terms, we also are able to pre prescribe medication, but we do everything as well in terms of psychological support, mm -hmm. social uh, interventions. But the psychologist really focuses on the behavioral transformation. Okay. So people are going to be sad naturally at Christmas because they have lost their loved one. What, what, what would you tell them? I think one of the most important things is to set up a system or a schedule of activities that actually help to counter the feelings of sadness. And this sounds cliche, but the reality is that exercise is very good. <laughs> and we have studies, empirical data, that have shown that physical activity is as efficacious as most antidepressant medication in terms of dealing with moderate or mild depression. Mm -hmm. Socialization is another critical factor because engaging in a conversation, just being in the presence of other persons helps to create a biochemical reaction in your brain that gives you a feel-good sensation. So these are important 
very simple things that can be done that have a significant impact on your mood and on your way right. of processing um, sadness. Yes, exercise is crucial. So people, I know some person now don't want to go to the hospitals because people around them say, you know, you're crazy. I want you to talk to those people. How, 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 how people who respond negatively to, to mental illness. Well, well, that's the first thing issue is that you have to go to a hospital. That's not yes, true. Yes, right. You can access mental health care in most of your health centers. In the same setting that you go to check your blood pressure, take your hypertension, oh, okay. your, blood, your, your blood sugar, and in a private doctor's office. And so the, the concept that it is in a restrictive environment is one of the things that we have to move away from. Yes. It can be a simple conversation. There's a wonderful program, actually, that a dear friend of mine from Zimbabwe actually has been using to actually train elder grandmothers to deliver mental health intervention for persons suffering with depression on a bench. So you can you see that the, the concept of getting mental health help is not something that you would think of having to do with a hospital or a hospital bed, but it can be done anywhere. And so the first we have to move our thoughts out of that restrictive setting and then move our thoughts out of what we think it is. It is not something that is forced on you. It is something that is done to help you based on what your needs are and we work with you. Yes, yes. In most cases. Yes, yes, yes. This has been Get the Facts. And we were talking about dealing with grief, especially at this time. And we want to remind you that exercise is important and that you, you may get help at the, at, the, at the clinic, the clinic in your community. So do not be afraid to go to the clinic. We were talking to Dr. Jeffrey Walcott, and he's a consultant psychiatrist. Thank you so very much for watching, and we see you next time when we have another interesting program. I'm Anthony Campbell. Take good care.